CCFR versus Canada. A lawsuit to challenge the unlawful banning of over 1,500 hunting and sporting firearms back in 2020. A court case years in the making, thousands of pages of behind the scenes documentation, and a ruling over 250 pages long. At the end of it all, the judge in this case, Justice Kane, ruled against us on all points. But what went wrong? Let's have a look. CCFR versus Canada was a pretty scant decision. Even the government experts agree with us that assault-style rifles are civilian rifles. What is going on here in Justice Kane? No, there's no way that the CCFR should have lost in this. This is where we win. Welcome back to the channel. So today we're finally going to be starting our CCFR versus Canada video series. I've long been promising this video series on the channel, and being now that we're close to the anniversary of the ruling, as well as the upcoming appeal to overturn the faulty ruling, I figure now's a good time. If you just want to know why we should have won the first time around, as well as why we're going to win in December when the CCFR heads to the Federal Court of Appeals, please check out Part 5. That part will contain all of the relevant information that pertains to why the government's order and council was ultra vires, and as such, it was against the law for them to ban our firearms in the manner that they did. This video is going to be an overview of the case itself to explain all of the particular topics which were raised, as well as why the judge ruled against them. For today's video, I'm going to start by introducing you to a couple of relevant legal topics you'll need to understand in order to interpret the information throughout the series. But then after that, we'll actually get into what transpired at court. Now before we start, we of course have the disclaimer. I'm not a lawyer, I have no legal background, nothing I say in this series or on this channel should ever be taken as legal advice. Now that being said, I have put in somewhere approaching the area of a thousand hours worth of work and research into this series over the last year in order to shore up a lot of my legal shortcomings. A number of the videos I ended up making on the channel have come directly as a result of the stuff I found out along the way while attempting to make this series. I have read the entire ruling from Justice Kane, cover to cover, as well as much of the courtroom tweets from Tracy Wilson. I've also relied on some of the court documents uploaded to the CCFR's website for some of the information when Justice Kane's ruling was a little light on her context or rationale. But with all that in mind, I will fully admit I have not looked at every single legal page or all of the underlying background information, and there is also no court transcript for me to refer to. So the primary focus of this series is going to be predominantly the ruling handed down by Justice Kane, and I will only mention external information as it becomes necessary. This video series is going to be at least six or seven parts long, but even with that in mind, there's still not enough time for me to explain every tiny little subtle detail about this case, or every single argument levied from every single perspective. Also, each of the videos in this series will be designed to be watchable as standalone videos, but will tell a broader story if watched as a whole. So if there are some topics you're just not interested in, you don't actually need to watch every single video. But if I say something which sounds a little repetitive or seems out of place, that's likely because it was covered in a previous or future video in the series. In this video, I'm going to be broadly addressing what was said by the applicants, as well as by the respondent, and then the various rulings held by Justice Kane. Of course, along the way, I'll also be adding, you know, my own two cents and supplementary arguments and ideas. And when the specifics are important, I will be slowing down to address them. But honestly... Not every argument was all that great from the applicants. However, there were also plenty of excellent points made throughout the series by the applicants, which I felt that Justice Kane really didn't give the credit that was due. In many instances, she even dismissed them out of hand simply because they were arguments contrary to the government's assertions. Not because the government's assertions were any better, mind you, but rather simply because there were contradictions and they would have been inconvenient for the government's preferred interpretations. But the reality is a little more nuanced than that. This court case is actually something called a judicial review. In judicial review, there are generally two standards that the court is to abide by. Reasonableness and correctness. Now, reasonableness is far more common and it is the standard that was used in this case. You don't necessarily need to understand it fully before we start, because I will be discussing the individual aspects of reasonableness as they become relevant to our topic. But it could be helpful to start off with some ground rules. The current standard of reasonableness is established in the Supreme Court case of Canada v. Vavilov. So generally speaking, anything stated in Vavilov is relevant to our reasonableness review and should be treated as the governing rules for establishing the court's interpretation of reasonableness. And Vavilov has this to say regarding reasonableness. A reviewing court must develop an understanding of the decision maker's reasoning process in order to determine whether the decision as a whole is reasonable. To make this determination, the reviewing court asks whether the decision bears the hallmarks of reasonableness, that is justification, transparency, and intelligibility. 
and whether it is justified in relation to the relevant factual and legal constraints that bear on the decision. Now, the government is also to be afforded something called deference during a reasonableness review. Deference is a bit of a complicated topic, but essentially it means that the government is sort of innocent until proven guilty. The burden is on the party challenging the decision to show that it is unreasonable. Before a decision can be set aside on this basis, the reviewing court must be satisfied that there are sufficiently serious shortcomings in the decision such that it cannot be said to exhibit the requisite degree of justification, intelligibility, and transparency. Any alleged flaws or shortcoming must be more than merely superficial or peripheral to the merits of the decision. It would be improper for a reviewing court to overturn an administrative decision simply because its reasoning exhibits a minor misstep. Instead, the court must be satisfied that any shortcomings or flaws relied on by the party challenging the decision are sufficiently central or significant to render the decision unreasonable. It's also worth noting as well that it will not be enough to say that a particular action by the government would be inefficient, which is a common argument that we use when discussing gun control legislation. For example, you can't argue to the court that the government banning guns is unreasonable on the grounds that there was a better use for government resources or that it will target us more than the bad guys or anything like that. Those arguments, as far as reasonableness is concerned, are essentially irrelevant. The courts in Canada believe that it's the government's place to be making these determinations, and as such, they don't want to interfere any more than is absolutely necessary. So, with those basic rules in mind, let's start looking at the case. I'm going to be referring to the case as the CCFR versus Canada, but in reality, it was six separate dockets from six separate groups simultaneously applying for judicial review. And most of the groups had far more than even just a single applicant. And the CCFR was only the lead for one of those groups. That being said, there was generally a lot of overlap between the various groups over what arguments were being presented, as well as how they were being presented. These various groups are referred to as the applicants, and they all had a bone to pick with the government in some fashion in relation to the order and council from 2020. However, there was only one respondent, and that is the Attorney General of Canada, who was defending the government's use of the OIC. Each side also had a number of experts who testified to the various viewpoints. Lastly, there will be a number of acronyms shown throughout the ruling, and I'll explain them as we go, but the two most important ones are OIC and RIAS. And they kind of mean the same thing, but also not. OIC stands for Order and Council. Most people have heard this term before, especially if you bothered to even click on this video, and these are the regulations implemented by the government to ban our firearms. Among other things, these regulations include the massive long list of 1,500 models of firearms which were prescribed as prohibited. And RIAS stands for the Regulatory Impact Analysis Statement. The RIAS is a section which is attached to the Order and Council that analyzes the various impacts the regulations are expected to have. I mean, go figure. But more specifically, it explains why the government has decided to implement these regulations. So if it helps, you can kind of take the OIC and the RIAS to mean the same thing if you want, but at a technical legal level, that's not really true. The OIC is the order and regulations itself, whereas the RIAS is sort of the justification, background, and potential impacts of said order and regulations. This is an important distinction since most of the criticism from the applicants, as well as the focus of the ruling, is largely based around the justifications and reasonings found within the RIAS, rather than on the content of the regulations themselves. And this is a sensible approach if the idea is to prove that the government acted unreasonably. As Justice Kane says in her own words, The issue before this court is a legal issue. Whether the government in council acted within its authority to make the regulations and made a reasonable decision to prescribe as prohibited the firearms that, in its opinion, are not reasonable for hunting and sporting purposes. So what are the legal issues at hand? Justice Kane's ruling breaks down these issues into seven distinct topics. Each topic has a similar format. Basically, she states what points the applicants raised in regards to each issue, and then what the Attorney General said in response, and then why she thought that the government was just right. <laughs> Some of these topics were short and relatively simple to go through. However, a number of these topics are going to get their own dedicated video in the series while I will explain them in more detail. The first couple of paragraphs or so of the ruling are mostly background information regarding the various parties, the standard of review, and the relevant details of the OIC. So the debate of topics doesn't even really start until paragraph 200 on page 61. And it starts off with a banger. So first up, should an adverse inference be drawn from the Attorney General's assertion of cabinet confidence and failure to produce the record before the governor and council? So what is an adverse inference? Well, essentially it means that the applicants are urging the court to treat the government's version of events as suspicious. For those who don't know, the government refused to disclose the information upon which they based the order and council. 
So the applicants are essentially asking the court to infer that the government and council either did not have the evidence before to support this opinion, or that the governor and council had information that did not support its opinion. Which seems fair. And this begs the obvious question. How can we know that the government actually formed the opinion that our firearms were unreasonable for hunting or sporting purposes before they decided to ban them? And not only that, but the government refused to disclose even the publicly available documents that they might have relied upon. The applicants rightly criticized this behavior, stating that if they are refusing to disclose even that information, it's likely that such information either doesn't exist at all, or, at the very least, it wasn't relied upon. The applicants also provided Supreme Court precedent detailing that the court drawing an adverse inference was entirely possible in circumstances like these. And the Attorney General responded with, and I kid you not, No. What? I said no. Why not? I don't want to. It doesn't make any sense. Too bad. It was two short paragraphs which basically said, we don't want to, and we don't have to. We have the power to make things confidential on a whim under Section 39 of the Canada Evidence Act, and we decided to use those powers. The Attorney General then also went on to say that this isn't to be treated as suspicious, since they blocked all information instead of only some information. Which, I'm not really sure how that's somehow any better, but Justice Kane seemed to think it was. Justice Kane ruled that no adverse inference was to be drawn, and then went on a 14-paragraph rant about all the reasons she didn't need to consider this as suspicious. Not that it was or wasn't suspicious, but that it wasn't even necessary to consider it. Chief among these reasons was the fact that such reasons were available, according to her at least, in the Rias. But later in the case, when the applicants tried to question various aspects of the Rias, such as criticisms that the Rias was inaccurate, or debates over what assault-style firearms are, Justice Kane often ruled that such criticisms weren't even relevant because these terms don't actually show up in the regulation. So she says that we can look to the Rias for reasons, but then she also says that we aren't to question the Rias because it's not relevant. Which essentially means that we aren't even allowed to question the basis of the government's actions in the first place. And this is a problem. Because you remember what the three hallmarks of reasonableness were in Vavilov? They were justification, intelligibility, and transparency. Confidentiality is the opposite of transparency. Not only that, but Vavilov also has this to say. In conducting a reasonableness review, a court must consider the outcome of the administrative decision in light of its underlying rationale, to ensure that the decision as a whole is transparent, intelligible, and justified. Judicial review is concerned with both the outcome of the decision and the reasoning process that led to that outcome. To accept otherwise would undermine, rather than demonstrate respect towards, the institutional role of the administrative decision maker. It gets even worse when you look at precisely how this all happened. Justice Kane conveniently left this information out of her ruling, but the CCFR submitted this in their official court proceedings. Starting on May 26, 2020, only a few weeks after the OIC itself was actually announced on May 1, 2020, the CCFR submitted their application to begin this whole legal process which included a request for the underlying information that the OIC was based on. The law states that such information should be produced within 20 days of that request. However, after two full months had passed, the government had still not gotten around to this, stating that they were just too busy with other things. After another month had passed, the courts ordered that the information would be produced by September. And then in September, rather than having that information ready and submitted, the government instead claimed cabinet privilege, saying the scope of the information they requested was too wide. So the CCFR filed again, and requested narrower information. But again, two full months later, the government said that this information was protected by cabinet confidence. However, the government also specifically stated at this time that they had not invoked Section 39 confidentiality, and that there would be no point in doing so, and that it would just cause delays. After a full year of perpetual stonewalling to something which should have only taken three weeks, the court even outright ordered the information to be produced under seal, meaning it wouldn't become public knowledge anyway. It was then, and only then, that the government issued a certificate under Section 39, making it confidential. And according to Justice Kane, that stopped really suspicious at all. Nothing wrong with that, just business as usual. She's like, oh yeah, don't worry about that, not central to the story. <laughs> like, that sounds pretty central to me. That whole debacle wasn't even worth mentioning in her ruling. It was somehow not relevant evidence. Sounds pretty central to whether or not the government had something to hide, if you ask me. And to be clear, this wouldn't have let Justice Kane compel the evidence after the certificate was issued, 
But absolutely she could have and should have found this suspicious in my opinion. It's kind of even crazy that she didn't. But I'll talk more about this in part two if you want to learn more about it. So for now, we're moving on. Next up, are the Order and Council and Regulations Ultra Viris subsection 117.15 subsection 2 of the Criminal Code? Are the Governor and Council's opinion and decision reasonable? And this section actually answers two questions. Was the order ultra viris and was the order reasonable? Ultra viris would mean that the government didn't actually have the powers required to ban the firearms the way they did. And, spoiler alert, they absolutely didn't have those powers. I will go over this in greater detail in part 5 of the series, but here's a quick summary. Section 117.15 of the Criminal Code is what gives the government the power to ban firearms through an OIC. So in part 1 it says you can prescribe things which are to be prescribed, and the definition for a prohibited firearm in section 84 of the Criminal Code, paired with this section, allows the government to prescribe firearms as prohibited unilaterally without having to go through the legislative process in Parliament. However, it says that it is subject to subsection 2, and subsection 2 clearly states that you can't ban firearms which are reasonable for hunting and sporting purposes. But there are two troublesome words in there, reasonable and opinion. What does reasonable mean, and how far can the government's opinion carry them? These are both valid questions which Justice Kane had unreasonable answers to. If you take the correct and reasonable interpretation of these statutes and of these definitions, it's rather clear that the government didn't have the power to do what they did. And I'll explain why in part 5, as it's a pretty long explanation which needs its own video. However, if we win on this point at the Federal Court of Appeals, it could strike down the entire OIC, meaning that most, if not all, of the firearms on this list will become instantly legal again. The other part of this section is whether or not the order and council itself was reasonable in case the court wants to incorrectly rule that the OIC was not actually ultra vires. But what makes a decision unreasonable? Vavilov has this to say. We find it conceptually useful to consider two types of fundamental flaws. The first is a failure of rationality internal to the reasoning process, and the second arises when a decision is in some respect untenable in the light of the relevant factual and legal constraints that bear on it. These questions will get answers in parts 3 and 4 of this series as well. Again, they're rather central to this case and it would take too long to explain them here. They need their own videos. But I do want to bring up one thing since we were just talking about the problem that Justice Kane didn't think it was suspicious that the government was hiding information, and that is her interpretation of the term opinion. In paragraph 324, she claims she has no reason to doubt that the governor and council formed the opinion that firearms on the list were in fact unreasonable for hunting or sports. And her evidence for that is simply because the government stated they formed the opinion on their OIC. Not the specifics on what they formed their opinion on, mind you, but simply that they had declared that they had formed it. And that was enough for Justice Kane. She goes on to say that such reasons can be found in the Rias, but if you take a look at it more deliberately, I can show you that it actually doesn't. For example, in 2018 and 2019, the government said they conducted extensive public engagements on the issue of banning handguns and assault-style firearms. And that sounds like they did their homework, right? But consider what that actually means for a moment. It means they went into the consultations with the answer ahead of time. It's not like they were at some crime reduction summit and the idea to ban guns to reduce crime somehow came out of that. No, they went into their so-called consultations from the outset with the intention of finding information to use to ban firearms. This means they had already formed the opinion even before the consultations had started meaning that the information borne by the consultations wasn't about how they were forming the opinion, it was about how they were going to justify the opinion after the fact. This means that if the government did actually correctly form the opinion that these firearms were unreasonable for hunting or sporting purposes, that opinion predates any information available in the Rias, and therefore the Rias doesn't actually inform how the opinion came to be or what information it was based on. Now, I don't know if any of the applicants actually argued that particular point, but they argued many other valid ones, which again, Kane opted to just ignore. For example, those same consultations also produced a significant amount of information and evidence that the banning of firearms would provide no additional public safety benefit over current restriction, and that the government's resources, time, and effort would be better spent actually pursuing real crime instead of targeting us. But that information was not disclosed in the RIAS. Additionally, the CCFR pointed this one out specifically, but the order claims that our firearms are not reasonable for use in hunting or sport, but then it also carves out exemptions for indigenous persons who are reasonably using these firearms for hunting or sport. So even within its own order, the government can't keep its story straight. And again, we see Justice Kane not taking these criticisms properly into account. 
Like, it would be one thing if there were a couple of small criticisms or inaccuracies to be made, and Justice Kane felt like such things don't override an otherwise valid order, but that's not what was happening here. But like I say, the bulk of this series is about discussing these points, so I won't say much more about it for now. Check out parts 3, 4, and 5 in this series if you want to learn more. Next up. Is there an unlawful subdelegation of authority from the governor and council to the SFSS to classify the firearms as prohibited? So essentially this section is about whether or not the SFSS has the authority to prescribe firearms as prohibited, and if the OIC gave them that power when they shouldn't actually have it. Now the SFSS stands for the Specialized Firearms Support Service, and it's part of the Canadian Firearms Program, which, among other things, is responsible for the managing of the firearms reference table, the FRT. The applicants argue that only the governor and council had the authority to prescribe firearms as prohibited. However, because the OIC prescribes regulations which declare unnamed firearms as variants to also be prohibited firearms, that duty for prescribing these variants falls to the Specialized Firearms Support Service. Also, because there's no lawful definition for defining what a variant is or isn't, the Specialized Firearms Support Service has to make up their own criteria when establishing whether a firearm is to be prohibited. The applicants argue that this goes far and above the mere administrative resource that the FRT claims that it intends to be. The firearms reference table is not technically legally binding, but it's so heavily relied upon by law enforcement and the courts that it has essentially become a de facto regulatory regime. However, the fact of the matter remains that the opinions of the Specialized Firearms Support Service are just that. Opinions. They're not legally binding. At the end of the day, no matter what the Specialized Firearms Support Service says or the FRT has listed, the courts have the final say in determining what a prohibited firearm is or isn't. And in response, the Attorney General said that the Specialized Firearms Support Service isn't prescribing anything as prohibited. Variants were banned by the regulations and by the Governor and Council. And the undefined definition is to be implemented by administrative decision makers and the courts. The Attorney General also agrees that the firearms reference table is not legally binding, but that it will have an impact on the ultimate factual assessment. And I think the Attorney General intentionally downplays just how severe that impact would be, but let's see what else he has to say. The Attorney General points to how the term variant is defined and implemented by the Specialized Firearms Support Service, citing Mr. Smith's evidence on how the process works. Chief among those considerations, according to Mr. Smith's affidavit, is a firearm's appearance and position of user controls, more commonly known as ergonomics. So according to the Specialized Firearms Support Service, a firearm is a variant of an assault-style firearm, and therefore an assault-style firearm itself, mostly due to appearance and ergonomics. And just a reminder here, this is the Attorney General citing his own government expert who works at the Specialized Firearms Support Service. This was not evidence or testimony produced by any of the applicants. So that's a rather curious thing for the Attorney General to agree to, considering how that's also one of the primary criticisms of the applicants regarding the banning of these firearms. But more on that later in the series. And despite all of this, of course, Justice Kane inevitably ruled that there was no subdelegation of authority. After all, the regulations do clearly state that variants are to be banned as well. Whether or not we are to ban variants doesn't have anything to do with the firearms reference table. A variant would be a variant even if the FRT didn't exist. Justice Kane then goes on a pretty good rant about why the firearms reference table is not actually legally binding, which is a good thing to know, and it bears repeating, the firearms reference table is absolutely not actually legally binding. As far as the concerns regarding the lack of a definition for what a variant is or isn't, Justice Kane defers to Mr. Smith's expertise on the matter. And that's also rather curious. The Specialized Firearms Support Service and the Firearms Reference Table are not legally binding, but the official definition of what a variant is is subject to the non-legally binding expertise of the Specialized Firearms Support Service and the Firearms Reference Table. And apparently Justice Kane sees no issue with that. And these three points are actually extremely important to a future talking point in Justice Kane's ruling, and create a conflict in her ruling that she doesn't even appear to be aware of. So keep these three points in mind until we get there. The firearms reference table is not legally binding, a variant is a variant even if the firearms reference table didn't exist, and there is no official definition for what a variant is, meaning it is a subjective and interpretive definition based on the perspective of who is doing the defining. So ultimately, it is only the court's opinion that matters. But again, like I say, we'll put a pin in that and we'll come back to these concerns shortly. But for now, we're moving on to the next section. So was there a breach of the duty of procedural fairness in the decision of the governor and council or in the assessment of the firearms made by the Specialized Firearms Support Service? Now, I'm going to be honest here. I don't actually understand this particular issue all that well. 
This section is the primary reason it took me nearly a year to get around to making this series. I never could find any like, concrete information to explain exactly what procedural fairness is, when it is owed, to whom it is owed, and so on. It seems to be a hyper-flexible standard which is incredibly subjective to each particular case. And as such, I won't be commenting much on this particular section. Fortunately, this section is also rather brief in Justice Kane's ruling. So essentially, the applicants argue that the Specialized Firearms Support Service can change the classification of firearms without notice to anyone and without any review or challenge mechanism, which exposes us firearm owners to extreme criminal liability. Which, of course it does. They also argue this would enable the government to nullify registration certificates without the chance of an appeal, as is normally the process permitted by the Firearms Act. So the applicants argue that this is a breach of procedural fairness. This claim appears to be predicated on the idea that there was an unlawful subdelegation of authority in the previous section, which Justice Kane ended up not agreeing to. The Attorney General countered with the fact that they aren't even supposed to be talking about this, and that this idea was apparently shot down even before trial. The Attorney General then went on to say that revocation from the Registrar under the Firearms Act are different from nullifications under the Criminal Code. Our registrations for our now prohibited firearms were not revoked, they were nullified. And that's a power, by the way, which doesn't actually exist in any statute in Part 3 of the Criminal Code, which is the section regarding firearms. So, what did Justice Kane say about the government not treating us fairly and using powers that they don't actually have? Well, unsurprisingly, once again, Justice Kane sided with the government. She ruled that there was no breach of procedural fairness, and she ruled that the Governor and Council acted in a legislative capacity in making the Order and Council, and that this somehow means that we aren't owed any procedural fairness. Procedural fairness is apparently only owed to decisions that affect the rights, privileges, or interests of an individual. And even though that the government has told us a thousand times that firearms are merely a privilege in Canada, it is apparently not privilege enough to give us any procedural fairness. She also mentions that we would get procedural fairness if they legislate a suspension. Something, you know, like prison time, which can also happen as a direct result of these regulations. So we appear to check all of these boxes, but somehow it still doesn't apply. And Justice Kane also reminded us that there is a review process. If we disagree that one of our firearms is a prohibited variant, all we have to do is wait until we're arrested and charged with a crime, and then we can just debate it in court when our freedom is on the line. Keeping in mind that this would be at least a violation of Section 91 of the Criminal Code, which could carry jail time of up to five years per firearm. Then we'll have all the procedural fairness and charter rights we would normally have, and of course, the judge will just take one look at the totally not legally binding firearms reference table and tell you that it's prohibited and that she doesn't have the expertise to question the Specialized Firearms Support Service. Yeah, that sounds totally fair. Now, like I say, I don't know enough about procedural fairness to actually question this, but if that actually is how little procedural fairness means in Canada, that's pretty messed up. For the rest of her ruling, Justice Kane discusses the constitutionality of the OIC as challenged by the applicants. From here on out, the reasonableness standard is replaced by the correctness standard. The big difference here is that the government is no longer owed deference for its rationality and reasons. In theory, we are now standing on even ground, and Justice Kane is to be more strict in requiring the government to justify its actions in respect to each section of the Constitution that gets brought up. However, in practice, many of our charter rights don't really mean what you think they mean, and there are precedents which give them something akin to a built-in deference anyway. The correctness standard also allows Justice Kane to assert her own ideas and her own interpretations over that of the government's as the starting point for discussions. First up in our charter battle, Section 7. So do the regulations infringe on Section 7 of the Charter as vague, overbroad, and arbitrary? And if so, is the infringement justified by Section 1? So to start us off, Section 7 protects the rights to our life, liberty, and security of the person. In this case, the applicants only argued for violations of liberty and security of the person. We'll discuss security of the person first since it's such a small part of the section, and it's, unfortunately, defeated rather easily. In paragraph 474, Mr. Giltaka, the big man himself, said that the regulations reduce his ability to protect himself. In the CCFR's final statement, his entire argument for the security of the person was also only a single paragraph. He basically said that conservation officers have AR-10s for self-protection, and that he is no less deserving of that same protection. That's kind of a pretty weak argument, especially if that's all he's going to say. But if we're being honest, it wouldn't really matter what he says. 
Both the Attorney General and Justice Kane rightly pointed out that precedent has already shut any such arguments down. So I think he brought it up mostly just to remind the courts of the fact, rather than necessarily any real intention to win on that point. Not that he isn't wrong, matter of fact I'd probably even agree with him, and such firearms are entirely reasonable and necessary in some circumstances for self-defense. But to win this argument in court would take a lot more than that, and probably would also need a radical shift in Canada's legal and cultural understanding of self-defense and firearms rights and so on. And Giltaka actually spoke a fair deal about that in the CCFR's podcast episode 177, so go check that out if you want to learn more about what he actually thinks on the matter. On to Section 7's Liberty Clause. It's well established in Canadian law, and all parties agree that the OIC engages our right to liberty since the regulations can result in prison time if firearm owners don't comply. However, that alone isn't enough to prove a violation of Section 7. You must further prove that this violation of your liberty was somehow fundamentally unjust, and typically that requires you to prove that it was somehow vague, arbitrary, or overbroad. However, there are other principles of fundamental justice in Canadian law, but none appear to have been used in this case. Of the three principles of fundamental justice, the arguments relating to whether the OIC is arbitrary or overbroad aren't as good as those which relate to the issue of vagueness. So to keep things brief, I'll only be addressing vagueness. In particular, I'm only going to address vagueness as it relates to the use of the word variant. The applicants correctly pointed out a myriad of concerns regarding the complete lack of an official definition of the word variant. And not only that, but also the way that it is defined by Mr. Smith, who works for the RCMP and actually does firearms classifications, even his definition for what constitutes a variant is highly subjective and therefore does not constitute even a workable definition. The CCFR pointed to multiple precedents indicating why vagueness is an issue. Not that the definition of vagueness is a disputed issue, but the Supreme Court of Canada stated that impermissibly vague laws mock the principles of fundamental justice, and no one may be convicted or punished for an act or omission that is not clearly prohibited by a valid law. And the CCFR correctly argued that the course of the Crown versus Henderson does not address the issue of vagueness, and that the court is not precluded from finding that the term variant is unconstitutionally vague, or at the very least, that variant should be interpreted to include only named variants. The Attorney General responded by stating that Henderson demonstrates that the courts can and do interpret the term variant, but that response genuinely fails to address the issue of vagueness. If anything, Henderson confirms that the lack of an official definition is, in fact, vague. In Justice Cooper's own words, he said, in my view, it is remarkable that any reasonable person would have known to register any firearms not specifically mentioned in the regulations. Although individuals have an obligation to inquire about the law, there are limits on how much they can actually be expected to find out by themselves given the complexity of modern legislation and the pace at which it changes. The Attorney General also contended that there would be fallout for any attempted official definition to be set. The Minister of Justice, who is a politician of course, says that a definition doesn't add clarity to the plain meaning and that definitions would produce unintended consequences. The Attorney General correctly inferred that such consequences would mean contradictions with existing declared variants. Which means that the Attorney General himself is telling Justice Kane that there is a problem with the list as it is. Let alone any hidden firearms which are not on the list or the firearms reference table. It's also his opinion, and that of the Minister of Justice, that having no concrete definition for their invented term somehow offers more clarity than having an official, unambiguous definition. Clarity is a very bizarre choice of words for that. So what did Justice Kane have to say about all this? Well, Justice Kane, of course, sided with the government. She said that not having any definition somehow actually provides a clear and intelligible standard. In 534, she points out that government expert Mr. Smith acknowledges that there is no legal definition. And in 535, he conceded that there is no standard industry definition either. He went on to explain that the RCMP relies on the ordinary definition of the word variant, and that the term generally refers to a firearm with a design derived from an original firearm. However, he also pointed out that most of the original firearms are automatic firearms, not semi-automatic firearms, and that any attempted official definition would lead to most of the firearms on the list being removed from the list. Again, further indicating that there's some kind of problem with the list. <coughs> Justice Kane, <coughs> pay attention! Oi, tell ya. Smith says that they rely on the dictionary definition of the word variant, but also that they don't rely on the dictionary definition of the word variant. Smith says classifying variants is a process which requires knowledge of firearms, but also that most variants in circulation are obvious to everyone as variants. 
Smith finished by saying that if anyone wants to know what a variant is, they should just call the Canadian Firearms Program to inquire about their firearms classification. And after all that, Justice Kane decided that the word variant is not impermissibly vague, even though there's still no definition for it. She agrees that any attempt to narrow the definition would exclude existing named variants. She says that certainty is not required, just that the law sufficiently delineates an area of risk. She says that it's far from impossible to know what a variant is, and then proceeds to cite several different sources which agree that there is no consensus on the definition. She also states that there is limited jurisprudence regarding the definition, and that somehow this means that the lack of a definition is fine. So just because it hasn't been defined in the last 30 years, means it doesn't ever need to be defined? I, I don't think so. Then we finally get to her ruling. She said that the named variants are not vague, and that firearm owners and businesses are expected to know the law. And, frankly, I would even agree with that. It is rather clear what's on the list in the OIC. However, she then also says that unnamed variants aren't an issue, and that absolute certainty of the law is not required. So we're put in a situation where we are expected to know what the law is, but that there will also be times where it's not even possible to know what the law is. And Justice Kane says that this is fine, because we can just contact the Canadian Firearms Program or look up the firearms reference table to determine if we have a variant. But do you remember that little pin I told you to remember from earlier? About Justice Kane's ruling regarding the subdelegation of authority to the Specialized Firearms Support Service and the firearms reference table? Well, let's bring that back up. These were the three rules. The firearms reference table is not legally binding, a variant is a variant even if the firearms reference table didn't exist, and there is no official definition for what a variant is, but ultimately it is only the court's opinion that matters. And here's where we get a contradiction in Justice Kane's ruling. So she says that if we want to know what a variant is, we are to ask the firearms reference table at the Canadian Firearms Program. However, she also says that the court's definition is the only one that matters which means we could look up the firearms reference table and we could call to ask the Canadian's firearms program if we have a variant and both the firearms reference table and the Canadian firearms program could tell us no. But we could still be arrested and charged with possession of a prohibited variant and we can't know for sure whether or not we're guilty until after the judge swings her gavel and declares us guilty. This possibility was brought up very specifically by the CCFR and it was not resolved by Justice Kane. So she ruled that the firearms reference table is not legally binding, and therefore there was no subdelegation of authority, but also that unnamed variants aren't vague because we can rely on the firearms reference table. But we can't genuinely rely on the firearms reference table to keep us out of prison because it's not legally binding, which means only one of those two things can actually be true. Either there was a subdelegation of authority and the firearms reference table is legally binding, or it's not legally binding and therefore the law is vague. She can't have it both ways. So, which is it? Well, it's very clearly established that the opinions of the Firearms Reference Table, the Specialized Firearms Support Service, and the Canadian Firearms Program are just that. Opinions. The term variant would exist whether or not the Firearms Reference Table exists, and that a listing on the Firearms Reference Table does not constitute proof. However, when Justice Kane was just asked about what a variant is, she deferred entirely to the evidence provided by Mr. Smith about how variants work as defined by the Specialized Firearms Support Service for the Firearms Reference Table. She provided no external information, no precedents, no comments from the Attorney General, and not even any of her own ideas or notions of what it would mean. Which means, whether she knows it or not, she did rule that the opinion of the Specialized Firearms Support Service is legally binding. If we were only to dismiss the testimony from Mr. Smith regarding variants, Justice Kane actually provided zero guidance as to what the definition of a variant is, which means the definition of variant doesn't exist independent of the FRT or the SFSS. Now that wouldn't be necessarily an issue under the reasonableness standard. In fact, it could even make sense under the reasonableness standard since they're supposed to defer to the government or the evidence provided by the government through Mr. Smith. But this is no longer the reasonableness standard, this is the correctness standard, because we're talking about Section 7 of the Charter. Babilov has this to say, The application of the correctness standard for such questions respects the unique role of the judiciary in interpreting the Constitution and ensures that the courts are able to provide the last word on questions for which the rule of law requires consistency and for which a final and determinate answer is necessary. When applying the correctness standard, the reviewing court may choose to either uphold the administrative decision maker's determination or to substitute its own view. While it should take the administrative decision maker's reasoning into account, and indeed it may find that the reasoning is persuasive enough to adopt it, the reviewing court is ultimately empowered to come to its own conclusions on the question. 
So Justice Kane had every business determining what a variant was for herself on the grounds of vagueness. And no business saying we should defer solely to the FRT or to the Canadian Firearms Program, or even to Mr. Smith in determining what a variant is. As Vavilov says, constitutional questions require consistency, and vagueness is a constitutional question. And therefore, there needs to be a concrete definition for what a variant is in order to create that consistency. It's not something which can just be allowed to be defined differently depending on who's looking at it, especially not if it can send us to jail even before we can know what that definition is. So when deciding that the law wasn't vague, she ultimately decided that the Specialized Firearm Support Service must in fact be an ad hoc regulatory body as the applicants had initially claimed, and that there is in fact an unlawful subdelegation of authority to the Specialized Firearm Support Service. And Mr. Smith admits that he and the Specialized Firearm Support Service make assessments based on the definitions in the criminal code, which is exactly the problem. There is no definition of variant in the criminal code which means they should not be legally capable of making these assessments without such a statute in the criminal code. And this is also why their idea of what a variant is, whatever that might actually mean, is not relevant to the court. It should also not be relevant to Justice Kane. Which means, after all this, there is still no definition for the word variant. Which means it is in fact vague and unconstitutional. But, <laughs> at the end of the day, this doesn't really mean much. Justice Kane ruled that any violation of Section 7 would be justified by Section 1 of the Charter because we're just firearm owners and we don't actually have any Charter rights. But it is useful to point out this rather blatant and extreme contradiction in her ruling. I'll be spending much of the series coming back to the problems with Mr. Smith's non-definition of the word variant to show just how extremely inconsistent it actually is. Because to be clear, he also offers no actual definition, nor does any other expert from the government. For him, it's a set of interchangeable parameters which vary in importance from one firearm to the next, for almost entirely arbitrary reasons. But for now, we're going to move on as we still have much more to cover. So, do the regulations infringe sections 8, 11, 15, or 26 of the Charter? And if so, is any infringement justified by section 1? Sections 8, 11, and 26 are pretty quick arguments to get out of the way, but then we'll come back to the discussion around section 15. Section 8 arguments were primarily provided by the general row applicants. Section 8 offers protection from unreasonable search and seizure, they argue that the RIA says we'll be compensated for our firearms when they are confiscated, but so far no compensation has been provided, and that no amount of compensation would be sufficient to the loss of freedoms to the use of her preferred firearms for hunting or sport shooting. They also submit that a grandfathering should have been permitted for individuals with the now prohibited firearms. The Attorney General responded by saying that Section 8 of the Charter is intended to cover privacy rights, not property rights, and that no constitutional breach of privacy occurred. Justice Kane agreed that this is not the intent of Section 8, and Section 8 exists to protect interests relating to privacy, not property. She also clarifies that in order to breach Section 8, three things must occur. A search or seizure must actually occur, the search must be authorized by reasonable law, and the search must be conducted in a reasonable manner. Like, for example, even if officers have a lawful search warrant for your house, it would not give them blanket authority to blast through your front door with C4, repel through your ceiling, and smash your windows and valuables, assault you, shoot your dog, and so on. Like, they aren't the ATF after all. And we'll come back to property rights regarding the Bill of Rights before the end of this video, but that's not covered in Section 8. So we're moving on. Section 11 is clear that its protections are only offered to those who are charged with a crime. So whatever we think of this order in council, no one has yet been charged with any crime, so its protections don't apply. The applicant, Mr. Hipwell, made a couple of arguments for Section 11 violations, but they appear to be arguments speaking to the vagueness of the order on counsel and of the word variant. But that should be covered under Section 7. Justice Kane then rightly ruled that Section 11 protections will apply once anyone has been charged with a crime, but not before then. And it might be that Justice Kane is somehow quoting them out of context, but this feels like a strange argument to be brought up by Mr. Hipwell, in my opinion. Not that vagueness isn't an issue, but that it's not an issue under Section 11. Even if we can't know what an unnamed variant is, the resulting charge for unlawful possession of firearm isn't unclear and we would have been informed of it. Now the cool thing about sections 8 through 14 of the Charter is that they can also be treated as principles of fundamental justice under section 7 of the Charter. And I made a video a while back talking about the progression of the buyback and in the second half of that video, I took a run at making an argument under section 11b of the Charter guaranteeing us the right to trial within a reasonable time. Now the TLDR of that argument was that normally there is an 18 or 30 month maximum before which charges are automatically dropped under the current threshold of the Crown versus Jordan. 
So if the government thought you guilty of a crime and froze your bank accounts and seized your property and whatever pending a trial, then after a maximum of 30 months, if the trial had not yet started, they would have been required to drop the charges and return your stuff to you, otherwise they would violate Section 11B. The Order and Council is already over 54 months old, which is nearly double the legal limit for criminal proceedings. And our property and assets are still frozen, and will continue to be frozen in perpetuity. The law doesn't allow the government to do that even against criminals, let alone millions of Canadians who have not actually been charged with an offense. The argument doesn't work explicitly because no one has technically been charged with a crime, but shouldn't that offer us more protection and not less? Like, can the government really persecute us more easily specifically because we've done nothing wrong? That doesn't seem right to me. And that's the gist of the argument made in the video. What I didn't know back then is that this charter right qualifies as a principle of fundamental justice, so it can be argued through Section 7, and perhaps there is a way to show the courts why it would be fundamentally unjust in that manner, but arguing it through Section 11 alone wouldn't be. Likewise, Mr. Hipple's complaint isn't necessarily a bad one exactly, it's just irrelevant under Section 11. We hear again from the Jetteroe applicants for Section 26, and they say that for all the reasons they argue for Section 15 violations, indicate that firearm owners have rights related to firearm ownership and use of firearms. And the Attorney General responded saying that Section 26 exists as a safeguard clause and it does not raise the status of other rights or freedoms to constitutional status. And Justice Kane agrees that Section 26 is there to act as a safeguard to ensure that the Charter doesn't take away existing rights. She then clarifies that there is no existing right to firearm ownership in Canada. The last of our charter rights brought up is Section 15, and this is the right to protection from discrimination, which are also called our equality rights. Now, once again, we see the general applicants leading the charge on this front, and they argue that firearm owners are part of the gun culture that has a long history and deep roots in Canada. They argue that the gun culture should be protected. They further claim that gun culture should be considered as an analogous ground to groups protected from discrimination in Section 15. They add that the regulations target members of the gun culture, discriminate against them, and stigmatize them, despite that they are actually quite law-abiding. They also allege that political messaging about firearms use is discriminatory and stigmatizing of firearms owners. The general applicants then go on to cite close to a dozen paragraphs of various precedents, definitions, and analogies to show why we ought to be protected. However, Ms. Jetterow acknowledges that her use of firearms is not ingrained in her DNA and is not an immutable characteristic but submits that firearms are part of her life. And that last part is the crux of the problem that we actually face. The Attorney General responded with just two short paragraphs saying that there is no analogy to be made between gun culture and other protected groups. He then adds that there is no evidence that gun owners face systemic disadvantages. Which is, which is just unbelievable. Let me remind you again to what Justice Kane said in regards to Section 1 of the Charter in this very ruling. Quote, the overriding goal of public safety outweighs any possible infringement on the rights of firearms owners, end quote. Courts and politicians have also long stated that our right to exist as firearms owners is merely a privilege, one they feel that can be confiscated at any time. We exist only as the result of their good graces. Do you know of any other minority group in Canada for whom that is the case? No systemic disadvantages? <laughs> like, get real. The OIC itself and this ruling from Justice Kane is plenty of evidence alone of the systemic disadvantage that we face. Justice Kane, of course, ruled that there was no breach of Section 15, stating, essentially, that there is no such thing as an official gun culture. Generally speaking, the threshold for protection under Section 15 is establishing that the thing being stolen from you by the government is an immutable characteristic, meaning that it can't be changed or that it can only be changed at great cost to one's personal identity. Justice Kane then points out that our participation in gun culture is a personal choice and not part of our DNA. And Ms. Jetterow submits that her identity is bound up in the gun culture. However, Justice Kane says that this is not an immutable characteristic. The Jetterow applicants also state that our culture is under a regulatory attack amounting to a cultural genocide. But Justice Kane also refuses this claim and says that it's not a real cultural genocide, and that it would likely be offensive to those who have actually experienced it. Which is kind of an unsurprising ruling at this point. Not only from Justice Kane, but the courts and politicians have long held contempt for gun cultures and firearm owners in Canada. However, if we look at it specifically from the context of the OIC, as well as the handgun freeze of C-21, these laws basically order you to surrender your firearms and to give up on your sports shooting. Two of the three guns commonly used in three-gun competitions are being effectively eradicated from society, and the courts are still ruling that that's fine, because there are other firearms you can use for hunting or sporting purposes. But not really. 
These bills are designed to be the death of the category of sport shooting called practical sport shooting, or action sport shooting. Competitions like IPSC, even competitions like single action sport shooting, which generally refers to the models of firearms made before 1900s, sometimes referred to as cowboy shooting, even that sport is under threat since people can no longer acquire revolvers in order to participate in it. So that's certainly a problem, but how does any of that rise to the level of protected grounds? Well, even people like Justin Trudeau agree that there is such a thing as gun culture, or at the very least, that it's a part of Canadian culture. It is a very real and tangible thing. Fear in here is that the first step towards registering your guns is, is just the first step towards taking away guns from everyone. That's never going to happen because here in Canada, we have a culture that has, that has grown up with guns. And we have a, a, a culture where the difference is guns can be used for hunting or for sport shooting in Canada. And there's lots of gun owners and they're mostly law respecting and, and, and law abiding. But there's a difference around the culture. And one of the things that we're yeah. seeing with the debate in the States is you get more and more of the American style, you know, right to carry self-defense arguments filtering up. Trudeau also believes that the loss of culture can be considered genocide. Trying to erase their language, their culture, that's an element of genocide. That erasure of identity, that minimizing of uh, a culture and negating of uh, a, a national identity uh, is uh, one of the ingredients of genocide, as you all know. Not only that, but Marco Mendicino had this to say about how immutable this characteristic is. And he said this in the Senate. So his words carry extra weight in that building as it is a matter of public record. This wasn't some off-the-cuff remark in some casual interview with a reporter on the street. And taking a trip uh, in the Overland Dawson Trail uh, with uh, gun owners, people who are not only uh, engaging you know, in a hobby, but, but for them this is a pastime. It's, it's part of the fabric of who they are. And part of who they are. That sounds pretty immutable to me. But like I say... The courts and politicians generally tend to display a lot of contempt for us firearm owners. So even these words, coming out of the mouth of Mr. Gun Control himself, are likely to fall on deaf ears. And you can top that off with the undeniable fact that the OIC corners our gun culture with only two bad options. Capitulation or imprisonment. And any who want to choose neither of these unlocks a very secret special third option to be handed out by the police at time of enforcement. But YouTube really doesn't like it when we talk about that. So I'm not sure what Justice Kane thinks real genocide is, but this is what it looks like. If the very same measures were enacted against a Christian, ordering him or her to surrender their rosaries and Bibles, otherwise face imprisonment or death, that would undoubtedly qualify as a cultural genocide. So it's not like the government action itself isn't wrong, it's that our culture isn't important enough to be protected from that action. And they have a word for that. It's called discrimination. But Despite all that I've said, I don't think Justice Kane was actually wrong to rule the way she did in regards to Section 15. I think the precedent is rather clear, and it's her job to follow that precedent. However, it's the precedent itself which is what I think needs to change. We would likely need to get this before the Supreme Court and really lean into it if we want the current interpretation to change. Now, if we explain it right, our community could even be the one which sets this change in Canada. Like, we're kind of the epitome for everything which is wrong with current Section 15 precedent. But if I'm being honest, that's kind of a long shot. We'd have to be viewed as important before any change could actually take place. However, of all of our constitutional rights, I think this is the avenue we need to take if we ever want to see some kind of constitutional protection for firearm owners in Canada. This in and of itself won't ever give us any official firearm rights like an American Second Amendment would in Canada. But if the right precedents are set, it could help to stave off the extreme intolerance and overreach of certain governments hell-bent on stomping our minority group out of existence. At the very least, it would be helpful to have some ground rules. As it stands now, the government can persecute us to its heart's content simply because it's convenient politically, and the Charter gives them enough excuse to do it. Section 15 protections wouldn't be enough to say that there should be no gun laws or regulation of any kind, but a correct interpretation should garner some kind of limit to just how far the government can take it, or what avenues they can pursue. And I actually have some of my own ideas on how to further that argument in showing discrimination. I plan to make a couple of videos in the near future after this series discussing the topic, but it's going to look at a different case. I plan to take a look at hate speech and discrimination as it's laid out in the case of the Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission versus Whatcott. And I think there are some pretty good arguments to be had there, and they will become extremely relevant if Bill C-63 ever gets signed into law. But 
that's a video for another day, so we're going to move on. And finally, do the regulations infringe the Canadian Bill of Rights? In the last of the arguments from the applicants, the CCFR brought up the Bill of Rights, stating that the regulations deprive us of the right to enjoyment of property. They also submit that this deprivation of property occurs without due process. The Attorney General responded that the OIC is the wrong legal process for this protection to take place, and therefore our due process rights do not arise. Justice Kane ruled that many of the protections of the Bill of Rights gained constitutional status when the Canadian Charter was adopted, but that this section isn't one of them. She states that its protections only arise in the context of adjudication before a court. She again says that this protection will become relevant after someone is charged on the fence relating to the OIC. And this is something that she ruled many different places in her ruling. And it's really frustrating. Like, what do you mean we can't talk about it now? Why do I have to wait until my freedom is on the line before we can answer any of these questions? I guess it's a very dissatisfactory answer. But if that's how the legal system actually works in Canada, then that's a problem with the legal system. That's not a problem with Justice Kane. I'm not a lawyer, and I don't really understand all the ins and outs of the various levels of our court systems or the intricacies regarding the hows and whens of it all, but she is a federal judge, and I can't imagine that she doesn't have a firm grasp on the fundamentals regarding all of that. So, that brings us to the end of the ruling. Justice Kane ruled against the applicants on all points and held that the applications shall be dismissed. As long as this video was, I still actually have a lot to say regarding the specifics of the ruling. The rest of the series will be me going over what I think she got wrong, as well as me supplementing the applicant's arguments with my own two cents. Most important of these arguments will be part five, where I show why I feel Justice Kane erred in her decision to rule that the regulations were not ultra vires. That being said, there will be some good information in the parts in between now and then, so be sure to stick around.